Today, Freddie Silva is joining us. He is a best-selling author, a leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and their interaction with consciousness. He's also a world-leading expert on crop circles. Uh, we get into all this stuff throughout the conversation today. We also have a deep focus on his book, uh, The Lost Art of Resurrection, which talks about a secret teaching or initiatory experience that's been passed down through the ages that brings someone into contact with their soul by inducing a near-death experience and then allowing that person to return and live out the rest of their earthly existence in a more fulfilled and aware state. Um, no other introduction necessary. You're going to love this. I loved it. Uh, sit back, enjoy, and please welcome today's Paradigm Sherpa, Freddie Silva, to the channel. All right, sweet. Um, so, uh, yeah, all right. So I got, I'm, I, like I said earlier, I, I got hip to you and your work through the lost art of resurrection. And it came to me at a time in life while I was um, attending uh, a school that was set up by Manly Palmer Hall, who mm. I, I imagine you're familiar with, um, you know, kind of brought free Masonic and esoteric wisdom to the West very early um, in the 1900s. Um, but through his work and, and my, my studies, um, I started to become aware of this concept of, of initiation into higher wisdom, um, non-physical realms of existence, um, the subconscious, the divine feminine, all these things that, uh, you know, are kind of outside of the scope of egoic consciousness in everyday life. And I read your book and it really struck me um, not just because of what I was studying at the time, but because, you know, I was brought up in like a Catholic household where we went to church every Sunday and, you know, they have the story of the resurrection of Jesus. Right. And, you know, what I read from your book and, you know, this concept of initiation and resurrection is that this isn't something that's, you know, meant to happen when you, the physical body dies, right. The, the goal is actually to go through a, a, death and resurrection of, of consciousness, perhaps, and maybe you can keep me honest with that expression, while you're alive, though, right? Yeah, and uh, the Gospel of Philip, uh, the ban Gospel of Philip is very clear on this. Uh, it says one must achieve resurrection while they live. If they wait until the moment they die, they get nothing. And that's what separated the Gnostic Christians from the Catholics that came along later. Uh, there was a big civil war that was going on at the time, and I was totally unaware of it, uh, having been raised as a Catholic, um, which because they don't want the story to come out that the, um, the, uh, the whole story of Jesus was a metaphor. It was never meant to be taken literally. And the Apostle Philip also said this as well. So not surprisingly, uh, they were saying that they're confusing. The fundamentalists were confusing uh, spiritual truth with an actual event. And the person that get nailed to a cross physically was actually a criminal called Simon, uh, which the Quran agrees with, and so did everybody else around the Middle East. So there's a completely different story that was going on that was never really meant to be uh, let out of the bag by the uh, winners of the Civil War, uh, which is the Catholic Church, uh, which uh, sort of sets off the whole trend of an underground movement of people who are practicing this mystical experience in order for people to understand that the purpose of the soul while they're still alive. Uh, because initiation literally means to become conscious. And you think, well, I am conscious. I'm watching this program right now. Therefore, I am conscious. Yeah, your brain's conscious, but is your soul engaged? And that was the big difference because people recognized that, you know, incarnation is a, um, a spiritual death uh, and it's, an, it's a worldwide concept. And they said the idea was to design these techniques whereby you are able to leave the body uh, for several days, travel astrally. And I'm not talking about shamanism either. This is very different to shamanism. And they said that uh, using these techniques, you can discover the source of the soul, its purpose in this life, and also become uh, return back to the body with this understanding, fully aware of where you've been and where you've traveled. And then you become much more aware and uh, definitive in your life. So your stage of conscious manifestation and the way you walk through life 
is totally aware. You are aware of your actions. You can modulate your actions. You can even uh, precede your actions by engaging the soul print while you're living and have a certain degree of um, control over the manifestation process. So these are big things, which, of course, the Catholic Church just was not going to let you do because they wanted to be the intermediaries between you and God or yourself, because we are the gods we're, we're looking for. Uh, there's no real difference. So this is very dangerous to allow people to find out who they are by themselves because it was putting all these people out of a job. So it was important to discover this uh, story uh, so that we can become acquainted with it. Yeah, you know, I, there's so much to touch on there. Um, you know, first and foremost, I, the, the the concept of the church being the intermediary and not wanting people to have this experience without them. Um, you know, I, I kind of almost get the sense the church doesn't want people to really have that proper experience at all. It, yep. No. You can't, it's easier to control somebody, right? If they just think, you know, if I just think I'm regular old Ryan Donnelly, my egoic consciousness, and I am... Uh, you know, the sum of all the conditioning from society and family that I grew up with thinking I am. It's another thing if I have this initiation experience or, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Ram Das, uh, Richard Albert, but he used to say something that sticks with me that we're all, we're all God dressed in drag. And it's kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but we don't know Absolutely it. Absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was hilarious. Um, but, uh, you don't know that until you you have this experience. Now, I've heard of people um, being initiated in a number of ways, um, certainly in the past. Uh, but, you know, more present day, I've only heard about it in the context of like people actually having near death experiences. And that yeah. sort of it, it prompts them to meet the soul or leave the body, travel astrally and um, also through sort of what you mentioned earlier, shamanic practices or engaging with an entheogenic substance like a psilocybin or an ayahuasca and, and, uh, you know, connecting with source or the Godhead or, you know, whatever the, the in that term you want to put on it is, uh, the fundamental energy that we all are. I don't know. There's, you know, words kind of fall short of really capturing it. But um, I'm not so like aware of um, modern initiation, right? It seems like this this practice of initiation was really something lost to history that was really important. Um, only select people got in. Well, I don't know. So like to reading your work and and getting more familiar with the concept of initiation, I've I've kind of seen it both like initiation was a very guarded secret only to select few and you kind of had to earn your way there but then i also like read about the eleusinian uh, mysteries and it seemed like there were festivals and stuff that were kind of like mass initiation practices um could you help me understand like if i was it a, has this always been kind of a secret thing uh that you kind of had to earn your way to the right of initiation or you know, was it both? Was there mass initiations? And and maybe, you know, where do you see initiation taking place today and, and this whole resurrection process today, if at all? It's, it was secret and remains secret insofar as it's a dangerous practice because it involves an induced near-death experience. I mean, think about that for a second. An induced near-death experience. And my research fo was following uh, people around the world, going back to 8,000 BC in Japan, which is where the earliest mention of this practice took place. And they used to take a poison uh, gradually. And uh, so you're literally killing the person they're about to be initiated. Uh, you are very close to death. And in order to get that kind of process, uh, you have to know what the hell you're doing. So yeah. it was very dangerous. And also the stuff that you learn on the other side, in the other world, when you brought that back into your uh, daily consciousness, you were totally aware of where you've been and where you've done. So you had control of the laws of nature. And that is very dangerous in the wrong hands. And that's why it took between three and 10 years to learn these disciplines so that they would spend the first year, for example, uh, as part of an outer brotherhood and sisterhood where they would look at you and uh, they give you sort of 
trials and all kinds of little tests uh find out uh, if your uh, your aptitude was correct but at the same time they would test you for a moral aptitude you had to be a very responsible person and you had to have moral integrity uh, and that filtered out people who were trying to get into the system uh, to learn this technique so they could use it against others that's not what it was about that's why it was secret and not because it was nefarious uh, so there were no mass initiations uh, jesus tried to do it and we don't know why uh, at the very end of his sort of, uh, so we say, the known life that's been portrayed, because he didn't die on a cross. I mean, he, his grave is in India, in Kashmir. He died at the grand old age of 80, and the locals just roll their eyes when you want to hear about it. It's like, yeah, he was, a, he was a guy like anybody else. I mean, thousands of people did this. What's so big about him? He was a good teacher, but there was millions of people that did this as well. It's no big deal. You know, he's over there. Go and see the grave. Uh, so they're very matter of fact about it, and uh, and it was true. Uh, the uh, the idea that they were just trying to bring into this whole initiation thing in the middle of um, towns in Galilee uh, is because he was desperate. And to this very day, the people who still maintain that tradition, which is the Mandeans, which is a highly persecuted Gnostic Christian sect of the. Uh, in southern Iran, who were persecuted by the fundamentalist Christians, so it's still going on, um, they are still angry with Jesus that he was trying to do shortcuts to initiation. And they said, no, no, there are no shortcuts in this. Uh, you either have the time to do it or you don't. Uh, you just let it go. Uh, there are no shortcuts to uh, illumination. So they're still holding a 2,000-year grudge. Now, uh, during my travels, when I was researching this material, I found that in the 1890s, it was still being practiced by a tribe of Native American people in the Great Lakes. Uh, and I think it was in the uh, Michigan, up in the um, the mitten of, uh, of Michigan okay. Peninsula. And yeah. I can't remember what the tribe was. Uh, it's a very unusual name. And the idea was that they would take this poison over the course of a day that slowly kill themselves, but not enough to physically kill you. You're just literally going under. And um, they would dig their own graves, they get buried in soil, you know, right up to their heads. And then they'd leave the body for about three days. And then to get them back into consciousness, the shaman would take a deer skin bag, fill it with rocks and pound the body. And that's what got you back into this daily life. It sounds like a very comical and very uh, excessive way to get you back into real consciousness. It was a rude awakening. But it still goes on in Guatemala. It still goes on in the Pacific. And again, they keep themselves to themselves. Um, yeah. If the, if uh, lawyers got hold of this, they'd basically sue everybody. I mean, how dare you go away for a weekend and have an out-of-body experience that could kill you? You better sign this document. Uh, everybody would jump all over this. So if you're in the right place at the right time, you will be approached. There are people who do watch out for this. And the, uh, in the Middle Ages in Europe, what they used to do, they used to have the troubadours, you know, which is a very old tradition of storytelling, hanging out in public squares and pubs. And they would, uh, you know, they'd start singing about, uh, you know, uh, a, a knight going off to rescue a damsel in distress in this burning tower. And the, most people would just see that as entertainment. But there'd always be that small group of people who would read between the lines and say, well, wait a minute. If I'm reading the story as a metaphor, uh, the uh, the knight is the initiate overcoming these obstacles to try and get to this tower. And the woman basically is, uh, well, she's like a divine bride and he marries her at the end. That's a great benefit. And they'd say, so what's this really about? So the troubadours would say, well, if you're really interested, uh, you can kind of, if you've got three years of your life, come and join us and uh, we'll show you some more. And it was kind of a, a way to recruit people of their own free will into the mysteries teachings. Uh, and that's how it was done. Uh, it was a very subtle method of saying, well, we're gonna put this out there. If you understand the story and you can see through the metaphor of what we're trying to tell you, then you're obviously already interested. So you're already you know, one foot into the, uh, into the mysteries teachings. And that's how they recruited people. It wasn't because it was a hierarchical thing. It was open to anybody. And I remember reading the story that was written on the spirit door by the uh, a servant in the household of the pharaoh Teti the first so this would have been about uh, five thousand years ago in egypt and it describes the uh, surprise of the uh, the servants to be allowed into the uh, secret things of uh, the pharaoh that he knew and he was allowed to, allowed to enter the chamber of restricted access and then he goes completely stum, doesn't say anything 
because you were never allowed to describe the experience because it would prejudice the experience of the next person. You'd read about the experience and you think, oh, I'm going to have that experience. Great. I want to do that. No, 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 no. We're all different individual souls. We've all come here to do different things. So the point was that to describe someone else's experience would color what you would expect to uh, to, ex to experience on the other side. And that wouldn't be of any use to you because that's not what you need. Your soul is here to do something else. So that's why that portion was secret. Okay. But at the very end of this uh, false door, they would write, and uh, in the end, I returned into the body and I found the way. And that phrase, the way, is the name of the teaching. Uh, we know it by another name in the Far East. It's called the Tao or the Dao which is still practiced in one way or another in the mystery schools of the uh, the Far East. And that is traced back to Japan about 8,000 BC. So it's very part of a very, very old tradition of getting people just to, you know, come in contact with their divine self and making the best of your time while you're still here. You know, it reminds me kind of of the Buddhist concept of the Bodhisattva, the one who is supposed yeah. to like reach enlightenment, but but stay in the world and carry that enlightenment out and kind of have a ripple effect of exactly people around them. Would you say, you know, in your opinion that like we all are here or we keep coming back, we keep incarnating until we, we have the, the resurrection experience and, and come back from that, you know, fully awakened or you know conscious and and then you know we don't have to come back or maybe we we could would choose to come back like as a you know there's been so many teachers throughout the millennium yeah. and many i'm sure whose names are just lost to history because you know they didn't become idols of yeah. uh, you know certain cultures but would you would you say that's kind of the, the what you feel is the purpose of of, of existence is to, to try and oh, it's to do life. the fact that you come here to have an experience i mean uh, the meaning of life is actually really boring when you when you boil it down uh, you, your soul is having an experience uh we've had trillions of experiences and we keep building up on those experiences and getting the t-shirt and moving on somewhere else Earth is a bit of an experimental way station in the universe because it's a very physical dense environment but at the same time, uh, you make big progress here. Uh, you can do all of this in the spirit world that we do here. You can eat sushi, drive a Mini Cooper, have great sex. But because you are a less dense body, the experience is not as tangible. You come here to have that tangible experience of uh, the physical world where taste is much more accentuated, sex is much more accentuated, um, drugs, drinking, music, uh, smelling flowers, everything is much more connected. And through that experience, because you're engaging with emotion or energy in motion, you make bigger strides. Uh, you can discover about envy, love, empathy, uh, anger, war, hatred, uh, all of these things are major polar opposites. And if you learn to do what you came here in your lifetime, well, that's fantastic because you don't have to come back here and do it again because you've had the experience. Now you can move on to Sirius or wherever you want to go. You can hang out on the planet beach for a million years and have a great time with dolphins, which is what I'm planning to do after this particular a very difficult lifetime. Um, so you don't have to repeat it unless you really, really want to. Uh, and that's also a teaching that seems to have been forgotten. You're not on the wheel of karma. I think it, the wheel of karma has been a little bit misrepresented. I think you're stuck in this sort of wheel that goes round and round and round like a hamster uh, if you don't get and understand the experience. So uh, there's a couple of clinical psychologists, and I'm sorry about the noise outside. There's a lot of construction. Um, you're, you're good. I can't even hear. Oh, good. It. Because yeah. it's bloody loud. <laughs> um, there's been some clinical psychologists that have actually got a lot of information from their patients, uh, which we also received during channeling uh, groups. And it's the same information. And uh, they were saying that, yeah, we had people who were lying down on the couch and they had problems with smoking or drinking and we'd take them down to 10 and we'd suggest something. When they came back to one into consciousness, they didn't want to stick a cigarette in their mouth ever again. But when they are away out of body, they start describing what's happening on the other side in full detail. And the next patient that shows up in the room picks up the story from the previous patient, which is very strange. So these people have basically had lives that they shared 
before they were here in this particular incarnation. And what uh, 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 Michael Newton specifically, the clinical psychologist I'm talking about, what he came to the conclusion was during his experiences with all these patients was that, yeah, you can basically learn from the experience that you have here. And if when you die and you move over, you can say, well, I'm not really satisfied with how I behaved. I want to go back and do it again. So that's plan one. Plan two, you think, okay, I understood where, I, where, where it was, but now I want to understand the point of view of the experience from the victim uh, or my polar opposite that was, you know, uh, getting me to do things that I shouldn't have been doing. Let's see how the world is from their point of view. So you become the other person and you swap roles. Um, or you come back to help out to fulfill another mission because there were several people involved in your particular soul group. So there are all of these parameters involved. But you as a soul, you're a very individual person. So if you've figured out, okay, I think I did pretty well here. I know where I went right. I know where I went wrong. And as long as you understand where you went wrong and you're familiar with the mechanics of that uh, concept, you go, okay, I know where I went wrong. I'm happy with that. I don't have to go back and do it again. So you could basically disappear and go and do something else. Uh, there's complete free will. Your soul has complete free will. It's really down to you. Uh, and at the end, there's no real race against time and to how you're going to develop as a soul. You have infinity to worry about that. Uh, yeah, so it's much, it takes a huge weight off your shoulders when you realize that you're in charge. There's no one in charge of you. You're in total control of your own spiritual development. But it goes back to what we were saying about initiation. The whole point of it, and, uh, going for these ridiculous and very time-consuming modules where you get yourself buried alive or you take a poison to kill yourself uh, just enough to maintain you alive – was to go back and find out, well, what exactly am I doing in the conscious world? You know, how do I make the best of my, you know, 80 years of my life when I'm down there in the, in on earth? Because I want to be aware and awake for every minute and have a degree of control over the process. And then I make the best of the experience. I, I, I don't waste a second. And that was the difference between in a religion, shamanism, and the initiation uh, experience was that you, you know, really were in total control and you made the best of every minute. So you, you can then use it to your advantage. And then when you physically die, you can say, okay, now I can go off and have planet beach for a million years with dolphins and penguins and things like that. I mean, it, it sounds, it gives me such a good sense of optimism when I think about all that. Like it, it does really relieve the pressure, right? Like, absolutely. Yeah. I think most of us, and well, I won't speak for you, but I would speak for the average Joe like myself. We get so caught up. We look we look outwards a lot for answers about who I am and what I'm doing here. And that kind of, to me, that kind of perpetuates that wheel of karma kind of experience mm -hmm. where you're like, I'm just kind of ping ponging around and I'm not really fulfilled. And I'm kind of just like running on autopilot and, that can be a pretty empty and stressful feeling, but you know, I've never gone through, like I've never been initiated by somebody, but I have, I would say peeked behind the veil before I've, 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 I've had a pretty transformative few experiences um, with psilocybin mushrooms where I, I, I came to, you know, I went through sort of the, uh, the death of my egoic consciousness and it was actually a really terrible experience because i saw all the lies i tell myself about who i am and what i'm doing here kind of ripped away and i was clinging to those desperately but then when i let go I, it was it was actually the funniest thing ever like i, I was literally laughing hysterically because i felt such bliss i'm like i am i am you know like uh, mm. i am everything that's here and it's so silly that I don't realize that in my everyday waking life. And now, you know, from those experiences, I was able to bring that back and it's, it's made meaningful changes in my life, but I don't have a sus sustained sense of uh, enlightenment or consciousness, you know, pure consciousness all the time. Like I still get very caught up in, you know, I'm Ryan Donnelly. I work a nine to five. I go, I like to go do activities but what you said you know at the end about like there's no 
race, right? Mm -hmm. We have infinity. We have all the time in the world. So like, even if you are kind of lost looking externally for answers, that's okay. Like you'll eventually get to this place where you'll be ready to be initiated or have this resurrection experience. And then you go on to the next. Exactly. I mean, Richard Bach said it very well. He said, there's a very simple test to determine if your purpose in life is over. Uh, if you're alive, it isn't. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you, everybody's different. I mean, if you compare yourself to anybody else, uh, you're in, you're really lost. Uh, it's like, oh, Joe over there or Mary, uh, they look like they're completely enlightened. Okay, good for them. That's their purpose. Some people wait till their last breath until they go, oh, I finally get it. Bang. That's all you need. You can be within 10 seconds of physical death and you suddenly have this wonderful uh, uh, epiphany and you go, oh, okay. And that's it. You're cleared. Uh, yeah. And some people get it right from the moment they're born. I mean, there's some kids that are just seem like they're way ahead of the pack, but yeah. that's their purpose. They've probably been doing this longer than you, but who cares? There's no race. The trick is, you know, it's and it, and it goes back to the whole point of existence. It's actually a very selfish existence uh, being here on Earth when you think about it. I mean, the idea is to contribute to the uh, the whole planet while you're here, make the place a little bit better than when you arrived. And that's also a wonderful thing to do, but essentially you're here to make yourself into a better person. Uh, and sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't, and sometimes you have to go through the, the process of hurdles. You know, and I can't say I'm perfect. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years and researching and going to all these portals and sacred places. And yeah, I'm a very different person than what, than what I was three decades ago and much better for it, but by no means perfect. Uh, I mean, if you were perfect, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't right. have bothered to incarnate. That's the whole point is to, you know, constantly... Uh, it's used a sculpturing metaphor. You, you're, you're a rough piece of stone. You're slowly chiseling away everything, you know, and finessing the detail until you become this perfect sculpture, you know. So and the trick is to either, you know, you can do it very fast, like uh, most Scorpios will do it fast. Most Capricorns will take forever to get there. Uh, Librans, you know, yeah, you'll get there in 80 years, but you'll be beautiful. It'll be absolutely perfect. And uh, so it, we're all different. Uh, the point is that we are all different and not to compare yourself with anybody else. And the idea was just to have all these techniques available that get you at, when you're ready and you're ready to look at this to engage with these techniques. I mean, I know that in India, they practice Kriya Yoga which is said to be the closest uh, possible uh, experience to the initiation because it deals with going into the internal mechanics of the human body as an energy source. So, and it takes years to perfect apparently. And I don't have the patience for that. I really don't. Uh, again, yeah, that's me. It yeah. talk, it's about understanding that you are a series of molecules and electromagnetic signals vibrating at huge speed that give you the impression that you're physical. Uh, because if you strip down all the air between the molecules in the physical body, you could squeeze the physical substance onto a teaspoon. That's how physical we are. We're not very physical at all. And once you get yourself in around that concept, you can start to use your imagination to see your body as an energy field rotating in, ge in geometrical form. And you're able to freeze frame it and move it upside down or stop it. And that's when you start engaging with your soul, who you really are. And you go internally, not externally, you go internally. Uh, like Jesus said, the, the kingdom of God is inside you. It's not out there, mate. It's not the priest. It's not the bishop. It's you. It's in here. He was a, an honorary Buddhist, basically. So Kriya Yoga gets to the point where you actually intervene in your own behalf, in your own temple, to become a better person. And like I said, from what I understand, it takes years to get to that point of complete oneness within yourself. Uh, it sounds like a very interesting uh, project. Uh, but again, it's nothing to do with shamanism. Shamanism is an approximation of the process. Or taking ayahuasca is an approximation because the chemical uh, in, um, interaction with a drug and your brain and your pineal gland is giving you an approximation of the experience. It's not the experience itself. And I've heard a lot of shaman in Central America uh, talk about this. And they said, yeah, uh, you can do this. Uh, you can do I'm Oscar properly. And it's very useful for clearing up a lot of stuff, especially trauma. But it's not the exact experience of initiation. For, to do that, you really got to go for the near-death experience. And that's very different. But it's good enough for now.
You know, I, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I, I go back to my Catholic upbringing. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not a Catholic anymore. Uh, don't go to church and stuff. Uh, but there's a passage I remember about like a guy who shows up to a, a wedding and he doesn't have the proper clothes on. So he's able to, uh, you know, uh, come and, and drink the best drinks and eat the great food but then he gets kicked out and you know at this point in my life i look at that as like the metaphor like kind of comparing the shamanistic uh practice to the the, the initiation and resurrection experience like mm -hmm. you you the shamanistic experience is the guy showing up to the wedding without the proper gear on so he has a yeah. little like he okay, come on in, we'll, we'll let you in for a little, but then you're not really properly dressed or you haven't gone through the proper steps, so you can't actually stay here and, yeah. and really party with us kind of thing. Whereas what you're talking about, if you follow the proper resurrection experience, then you can stay at the party or the wedding. So you Yeah, know, you've got to have the right clothing. Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah. clothing, it's, I mean, parables were the way that you got the, the story across uh, to the sure. curious. Uh, yeah. The clothing is really to do with the, the reading, the knowledge that you've, uh, that you've learned to understand, to give you kind of a suit of armor to enable you to go through the whole process. They were very clever in the way that they disguise all this stuff. Uh, so to the average person doesn't really care or the average bishop or priest, uh, it's just a silly story. Uh, we we don't have to kill them or crucify them because they're too stupid. Yeah, that's how they got away with it. You pretend to be stupid and you get away with murder, literally, uh, because now you're saying the information is pretty well guarded. Uh, yeah, you have to develop this mantle of information in order to get you to the stage where you don't need logical information to get you to understand the biggest mystery of life, which is yourself. Uh, you can't use logic to get there uh, or even to try to understand it. Um, I've been very fortunate in my life where as a seeker and a teacher, I tend to go into these places where the practice used to be uh, practiced uh, without really knowing what was going on. And I've left the body, I've been to the other side, I've come back and I've written about it because yeah. someone's looking after me because they know more better than I do, or at least they did at the time, I think, <laughs> um, that, you know, this is what the, my purpose is to be a kind of a teacher to others. And in order for me to write what I do, I like to write from a first hand experience, not just sit here, read other people's books and regurgitate it. Anybody yeah. can do that. Uh, and um, so for me, it was a sort of um, a, a quest for understanding and being curious about the process and trusting that someone's looking after me on the other side to allow me a glimpse of what's going on and send me back. Uh, leaving the body is easy. The problem is returning. Uh, I've had one person in one of my groups in Egypt who I always tell people and warn them about going into the box in the king's chamber because there's no one actually buried in these pyramids. Um, it's a very dangerous box. Uh, leaving the body is so easy. You can do that in 10 seconds. The problem is getting back and uh, many people die there. Uh, th this is something that's not revealed by the authorities because it would be bad for tourism. And I can understand why. Uh, people die there all the time. They think they're going to spend the whole night in the box, have a wonderful yeah. time, and they will, but they don't know how to find their way back. And there's always a dead guy in there every couple of years that they had to retrieve. Um, I've done it. I've come back, and it's a very extraordinary experience, and it's got me to understand the process so I can research it and write about it, and that's a big difference. So and that's not really open to everybody. It's just the fact that that's what I'm here to do. Uh, and I wasn't even aware of that until it happened. And then only with hindsight would I think, oh, this is really interesting. So, yeah, I was allowed to go for the experience because that's what I'm curious enough to understand the process and trust the process in order to uh, experience it and then tell others about it. And then they will approach it in the way, in the manner that, that they wish. So it's, um, yeah, it's very magical. The whole thing is very, very magical. It is. And I mean, it's got to be rewarding, right, to one, have the firsthand experience and the intuitive internal knowing of what that's like. But then to be able to be a node, like a, a light in the darkness for other people who are kind of finding their way on their own path. But you're like, hey, here's here's me with my info over here. And maybe it will help you on your journey. Like, I, I certainly admire that. Um, 
you know, I've, I've, it's funny you mentioned the Great Pyramid. Like I, I've been and I've, I've laid in the, the box, uh, but then, you know, got out in like 15 seconds. I was with a, a group of like 10 people and wasn't in a position to, well, <laughs> I probably would have died, first of all. I tried to sleep in there at that point in life and, and maybe even now, but um, got, I, I, in the few minutes I was there uh, or a few seconds I was laying in there, I felt quite profound and I don't know if it was me just projecting because I was in this giant ancient thing or there was something actually to it. Um, you know, you, you've mentioned, or at least what I've taken from some of your work is that these physical structures actually have properties to them that can, yeah. that are, make them suitable for this journey where they're help helping facilitate it as well as you yourself facilitating is that is that fair to say oh very much so and we have the technology now to measure uh what these places do there are they're big electromagnetic boxes uh whether it's a great pyramid or the dolmens or even the standing stones uh they carry a lot of electromagnetic signature <laughs> excuse me and um, so we know that these things are alive. And uh, if uh, reading a lot of the ancient traditions of some of the oldest tribes on the planet, uh, the Hopi, uh, the White Hara of New Zealand, uh, the Aymara of South America, uh, they talk about the same thing, uh, that in the old days when they were hanging out uh, with a parallel civilization of what we end up calling the gods, who were people just like us, they were just much taller. Uh, and also they knew about more about the laws of nature and how to bend them. And that's what they actually had as they are described. And they said, yeah, these people were much closer to the way of things, which is the, uh, the way to go. Uh, the physical world. Yeah, it's great, but you have to understand what underlies the physical world. Once you get to that point, you become as a God, uh, a God is nothing more than this, the soul around any object, a glass of water has a God, a blade of grass has a God and so forth. That's what a God is all about. And they said that um, we learned from these people that they were here a long, long, long time ago before humans even showed up and before, uh, and as we're becoming and in, developing into hunter gatherers and getting to understand the mechanics of things, they would, you know, they'd slowly teach us uh, about things. And one of the things that we learned, and again, I'm paraphrasing what their stories, um, they said that, uh, you know, back in the day, a long, long time ago, and it could be, it sounds like millions of years this has been going on. Um, they could uh, go backwards and forwards to their point of origin, and they always bring up the belt stars of Orion, the constellation. And that happens in every culture on the planet. And, and a specific portion of Orion uh, in the Central American, also in the Pacific, is the M42 cluster, which is the bottom part of Orion if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. It forms a sort of a, sort of a triangle with the belt stars, and right in the middle of that triangle is this sort of cluster you can almost see it with the naked eye under ideal conditions it turns out that it's um, the biggest star forming region of the galaxy and this is now known by nasa so it's a constant point of creation and they said this is where we all came from that's where the gods came from it's where humans came from and we can go backwards and forwards using spaceships or they call them the uh, flying discs uh, in um, the hopi tradition and uh, but then they forgot how to do that. So they had to develop special buildings, develop special buildings in order to recreate the process to take your body from A to B. Well, that brings up the experiences of people in the Great Pyramid. And then as the world progresses and a few thousand, maybe a few million years later, uh, we forgot to do that as well. So now we have to do it shamanically. Uh, we can't just do that because the planet is evolving, the universe is evolving, and everything has their own, own specific time. So that you've gone from spaceships to buildings to shamanic, uh, only in the last 12,000 years, by the way, uh, since the Great Flood. Uh, and this is something that's repeated in every single ancient culture on the planet. Uh, this is why these buildings were created, because you go to uh, Egypt or India or uh, even uh, Northern Europe with all the giant graves and the dolmens, there's no one buried there. Uh, I mean, 85% of all the dolmens that were excavated, and I'm talking about not just the stone structure, I'm talking about the original mound of earth that used to enclose the, uh, the structure, because what we see in the dolmen is the remains of the structure that's now eroded. Uh, a lot of people don't uh, don't know that. So they said that, yeah, 85% 85, 85% of the all these structures that were excavated, there's no one buried in there. So why are they called burial chambers? 
and, uh, and then it goes back to what the Egyptians were saying. There's physical death and there's metaphoric death. Uh, and if you know the alignment of where it's going to, there are certain alignments that are associated with the tradition of initiation, then you'll know that that place was for a uh, non-physical burial. It was a metaphoric death because you expect it to come back into your physical body. So essentially, the buildings and the rocks that were chosen for the process were very specific. They have a high content of quartz, iron, and magnetite. And they're, together, they create these little magnetic fields, which are just large enough and concentrated enough to disturb the uh, uh, space-time uh, continuum and allow you uh, a, a, a sort of a little breath, a little tube where you, your soul can leave the body and come back again. Uh, and we can measure this now. Uh, we've, there was a, a famous experiment done by, um, uh, it was Pierre Mero. He was a, a skeptic of all of the stuff that we're talking about. I mean, if he was still alive, he'd call this mumbo jumbo. Uh, he was an electrical engineer and he went around poking all these dolmens in uh, the Northern France around the Karnak region, where we have one of the highest concentrations of stone monuments. And he said, no, they're actually alive. You can measure the the energy. It builds up every 80 minutes and then it dissipates. If you're there at the wrong moment, at the wrong time, you touch these stones, you get one hell of an electric shock. And all of these things were designed to alter the difference in frequency from the outside so that when you go into these uh, original chambers, the laws of physics are slightly different and it gets you to have that out-of-body experience. So they are their own spaceships, if you want to call it that. Sure. Sure. And it's, gosh, it's, uh, it's a little sad to me when I think about this, that it's, it's so lost, right? Like I, I just, I know we're all we're on our own journeys and, and, and things like that, but you know, there's a big part of me that thinks if more people were aware of the concept of resurrection and these ancient technologies that could help facilitate that process, I feel like People would want to, you know, put the time in to get themselves ready to go experience it. Um, yeah, you think so. But then again, we're all different. Some people came here to be complete morons for a lifetime. And uh, yeah. it's not a judgment. That's a dozen observation. People yeah. come here, they're brand new souls. They don't know what's going on. And they make a mess of things. But they'll learn from that when they leave. Yeah. Uh, again, it goes back to Earth being a big uh, PlayStation, and some people come here to build a sandcastle, some people come by and they knock it down. Uh, it's never going to change. It's not going to improve. That's the way it's meant to be. It's your reaction to these things that's uh, the difference. How do you behave in these circumstances? Are you going to be the bully or are you going to be the mystic? Uh, you have a choice. You can be both. Uh, and I think it's very important to understand that uh, because it defines who you are as a soul. You find your purpose at those moments of challenge. You know, do I join the bullies? I'm, am I going to be a pathological liar and become president? Uh, you can read into that whatever you want. Uh, or am I going to be here and become a, uh, you know, a, a piece of enlightenment for others to follow? I mean, I, I bring up Gandhi in that point, and he'd be the first to say, well, I'm not perfect. Uh, because I also had problems, and he did, and he acknowledged them. But he was aware of the process. But the effect that he had, the positive effect that he had on so many millions of people, is because, like he said, you know, be the uh, the change you wish to see. He just led by example. He wasn't converting anybody, but he just said, "This is who I am. I've got my faults, but I've also got some things to offer. If it pleases you, if it makes sense to you, then follow those bits, but follow yourself." Don't follow me. You've got to follow yourself. Use what I've done as a as a, a tool and then develop your own toolbox and gradually you'll get there by yourself. And I think it's a very honest way of looking at uh, the whole process is that you don't really look at, uh, you examine what other people have done, take what makes sense, but apply your own experience and then you build up your own set of rules. And hopefully you can sort of massage these as you go through life. You know, rule 15, that didn't work out so well. Well, we'll get rid of that. We'll bring, we'll create rule 22 and, oh, that works a bit better. So it's a constant process. It's like trying to make a stew. You're gonna, it's gonna uh, taste horrible the first time you do it. But the 10th time, everybody wants to come around for dinner because now it tastes really good. And that's it. And don't beat yourself up over it. I mean, you did the best you could, but now that you're much more aware of the process, you're finessing, you're getting better at it. Uh, and that's very important, not to beat yourself up over the whole process because, you, like I said, you're incarnated, you're not perfect. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, yeah. That, I mean, that implies separation from the totality, kind of, or at least the veil of separation, the illusion of separation when you're incarnated, right? Yeah. Like we're all one thing. The filter of our nervous system makes us kind of feel that we're not. Um, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of like a musician, kind of like you're, you, uh, just like with your soup metaphor, like uh, you pick up an instrument, you're terrible, but. The point is to just keep trying and then go have, once you're, you finally perfected the instrument, man, it's, life is so fun and rewarding. Go make some music, go find some other people to make music with. And, yeah. and the point is just to experience, right? And, exactly. and there's no, nothing really to it besides that. It's like uh, uh, Alan Watts, I think used to say, like the point of, of, of a song isn't to rush to the end, right? It's to dance while the music's playing and enjoy yeah. the process so even if we're not perfect that's okay we can still enjoy the process whether it's one lifetime or trillions of lifetimes on that journey back to perfection yes enjoy the experience and the energy i mean there's no such thing as bad music it's just your reaction to it i mean um <laughs> stockhausen there's people that like stockhausen i mean it for me it's just noise but that's me. I mean, you know, but then again, I also can listen to the Sex Pistols and be quite happy with that. Just yeah. as I am listening to Vivaldi. I mean, it's, uh, but that's who I am. It's, there's no such thing as bad music. It's the experience. It's the feeling that you get out of it. And that's what's important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Freddie, I mean, there's, I could talk to you forever, but we are coming up kind of on the hour. <laughs> I feel like uh, rather than try and get you to share a bunch more about, you know, uh, all the interesting stuff you do. I think maybe this is just an organic place to kind of close, but um, yeah, I, I want to say thanks for your work. Um, I certainly view it as, you know, a light in the darkness for me. It's helped me with my journey. I've been able to pick pieces from oh, things I've read and makes my experience here much more fulfilling. And, you know, I know it's going to do the same for people who get to watch this and especially if they're not familiar with your work and they go out and read your work and then they, you know, go try and experience the things that, you know, you, you put out in your work. So, um, yeah, I, I guess, thanks for being here. Um, oh, before, my pleasure. before we wrap, uh, well, before we go, what's one thing, you know, if you had one, one word of wisdom or thought to share with people that, you know, you'd want people to know that are to watch this. Do you have anything that comes to mind that you, you'd want people to know One message? Um, drink heavily. It's the only thing that makes any sense. Um, no, I mean, it's, uh, it goes back to what I was saying about not beating yourself up. I mean, you came here knowing that's the funny thing about life. You as a soul, you know, everything, but when you incarnate, you end up forgetting everything. And that's part of the process. So the trick is to learn more and understand the process and not be bothered about the fact that you're not getting it right all the time. Uh, and uh, just do the best you can uh, every single day. Now, and that's one thing that the Knights Templar, uh, who are part of these mysteries teachings, by the way, uh, who didn't become, they changed their name to Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Uh, unlike the London Rite Freemasons, which are a completely different group of people, you don't want to hang out with that lot. Uh, nothing to do with the original teachings, but yeah, these people came, uh, were drawing from the Essenes, they were drawing from the Mandeans, they were drawing from the Persians, mystics, and so forth. Uh, it's a very long tradition. The trick is to learn the techniques and the methods and the tools and try to apply them and do the best you can. Not beat yourself up do, uh, because you don't know everything. Sometimes you've got to fail, but the trick is not to make a habit of falling down okay you, you will fall down and you and i've done it too and i'm still doing it the trick is not to make a habit of falling down and on your face and and if you do learn from the process uh and uh you know forgive yourself i mean otherwise uh, you'll be sitting there worrying about everything all the time why uh, it's not going to do you any good you might as well do the best you can because uh, you've only known so much and you're, enjoy, you're enjoying a, a moment of rediscovery and remembrance. Uh, and the more you remember, the more you realize the plan. Uh, so if you can get to the point where you can walk your life aware 
uh, of these things, then you're already 50% ahead of everybody. Not that it matters, but at least you're doing yourself a huge favor because as long as you, the more you're aware, the more you're in control. And that's the important thing is to develop that degree of control over your conscious uh, life because then it becomes very useful. Uh, and, I, and I will say this, uh, it's partly a joke, but it is very true that yes, you can win the lottery <laughs> with these techniques. And I can't tell you how much money I've lost uh, by having the right ticket with the right numbers and then fail it, sorry, uh, having the right numbers and failing to buy the ticket minutes before the gate closes because someone comes into the shop and says, oh, I haven't seen you in ages, how are you? And by the time we finish talking, the gates come down and I've lost another $50 million. Um, I lost $1 billion in the uh, last lottery just before I left for e trip. And I had this little bird in my head saying, um, or I call it the management, saying, you, you want to play the lottery? I said, oh, I think, oh, great, finally get to win. And of course, I'm packing up to go to Egypt. And I, at the end of the day, I thought, oh, I forgot to play the damn numbers. And I got to Egypt and I checked in on the lottery. This is the mega bucks or something. And it, uh, it was up to 1.2 billion, I think. And the winning number literally came from up the street. And I thought, you see, this is how it works because my path was not to become rich as a result of winning the lottery. It's because I have to work hard for what I do, possibly because I was a god or a king or a queen in a former life. And now I have to get used to being a pleb and work hard every single day, which is what I do. So, and I become very philosophical about that. And I get uh, together with people in my uh, group in, in England once in a while, and we'll sit together. And the first thing you do is uh, figure out from everybody, all right, how much money have we lost this year? And it's like, uh, some of the stuff is like, yeah, I just uh, lost 120 million. Yeah, I didn't play the lottery because uh, la, 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 la. And it's like the management having a joke at your experience to say, yeah, you can now connect with the bigger scheme of things. You're totally in contact but that's not your path. We're just showing you a very simple way to demonstrate that you are in contact with your feelings. You can connect with the force for lack of a better word, but that's not your path. So don't worry about it. And you just laugh it off. But yeah, the amount of money that, uh, what I could have done with all of that money and improved the world, but yeah, it's not my path. So why worry about it? So that's my advice. Just to, you know, to be happy and do whatever it takes and listen to good music um and do what it takes to have a, a good a day every day i love it and uh, i love that you get those little winks from the uh the force if you will to just just play oh. with a little bit <laughs> yeah george lucas was very much i don't know how much he was aware of the spiritual element in what he wrote i suspect that it was uh and he didn't want to give it away because it may have prejudiced people against his work uh, which stands up to this very day, even though we don't talk about Star's, Star Wars 1. It's just embarrassing. Uh, that episode never happened. Uh, but uh, the Force is exactly the way. It's a tower. That's what, exactly what it is. Um, and even Yoda is a real person. It's based, the character is based on a real uh, guy. I think he's like a yoga teacher in uh, Sao Salito, and he talks that way as well. So a lot of the mechanisms that you see that we laugh about to this very day are actually real things, real concepts. And that's why we like the series, or m many people love Star Wars because of that. There's a ring of truth to it. Uh, and and Star, um, Star Trek is also the same thing. And Gene Roddenberry also attended uh, groups like mine in Britain. And uh, he, under a pseudonym, got a lot of the universal law and rewrote it under a space age scene called Star Trek. And that's why it has a cult following, because you know that it's imparting a lot of information. If you look at Jean-Luc Picard as a character, who's a real person, historically, by the way, uh, you check him out. It's okay. not a make-believe name. Uh, that series is, I can't tell you how good it makes you feel when you get that out of the library on DVD and watch it over again. It makes you feel good because it gives you hurdles that you have to cross over. Uh, there's always a challenge dealing with new people in the universe. How are you going to behave? How are you going to overcome these hurdles with the Borg or so forth? But they do teach you at the fundamental stage when you strip the space age theme away, they're actually teaching about life and how to live it properly. And the joke, of course, is the one most important character in the whole series that 
few people pay any attention to and it's Guinan the uh, bartender and she gives you the best information about life and how to live it just like a, a proper barman here on earth sure, there's a sure. little joke there so watch it again it's very important uh, as a carrier of wisdom all right well I will definitely revisit Star Trek and and you might be pleased to know that um at some point this year once her book comes out I'm, I'm gonna have a conversation with uh a former teacher of mine, Dr. Krista Noble, and she has a book she's uh, done writing and about to get published about the Eastern themes uh, within Star Wars. So that is the whole focus of her mm -hmm. book. So I'm very I glad. I have to get that one. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, no, it'll it'll be a good one. So um, I'll at least shoot you an email and let you know when it's out. But Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Freddie, uh, again, this is this has been an absolute joy. I'm uh, oh, thanks, Ryan. Really, I feel uplifted just from interacting with you, and I hope that everybody that watches this uh, feels the same way and feels, you know, excited to go read your stuff um, and uh, you know carry on their journey with uh, the positive, exactly. like you suggested. So, and if not, they're not getting their money back. <laughs>